And now, the Sleephawk Worldwide Podcast. Here are your hosts, Brandon Staten and Tyler Hensbro. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Sleephawk Worldwide Podcast. What's up, everybody? It's Big Hulk. Uh, it's a great week. It's been a great week. Uh, I've been watching a lot of Kendrick Lamar highlights on oh, yeah. Instagram. Me and, me and Sleep are big into the hip hop culture. Yeah, so, we've been deep. Oh, man, ready for a great pod, though. I mean, guys, there's so much stuff just flying off the shelves up here. Uh, there's so much to talk about. Uh, we got a presidential debate this week. Um, yes. We got Kendrick and, and Drake. We yes. got Hawk Tua. <laughs> we got all kinds of good stuff, but we'll kind of stick to some uh, simpler subjects. We've got uh, we're going to make hockey appearance on here, guys. This whole Stanley <laughs> Cup thing, you ain't paying attention, me either. But I'm about to be because tomorrow night's game seven. It was three zero. All right, now it's not. So we'll talk some about that. Scotty Scheffler just won again this afternoon. Today's Sunday. Uh, six wins. It's not even July yet. Um, talk about that. Talk about the protesters that came on 18th Green. If you were watching, I've got some interesting observations about that one. Uh, our heels lost in the college world series, man. What a great season bummer. They didn't, uh, fare better, but, uh, but yeah, what a run. We touch on that. Haven't talked to you guys since the Celtics won the championship. We'll talk about how boring that was. JJ Reddick, new coach of the Lakers. Get into that. Monty Williams, old coach of the Detroit Pistons, uh, might be the richest man in America, richest unemployed man in America. Um, uh, might even talk about that. Might even just, spring off into some other subject because guys listen we sat here and tried to think of something to talk about Tar Heel related <sighs> ain't happening man I brought the t-shirt that's all we got so um <clears throat> let's start with hockey dude first of all no actually let's not do that let's not do that because guys right before we came on the pod and this is great because sometimes we're trying to struggle with things to talk about and as we're doing that we just you know we probably spent the last hell 30 minutes Talking about what we're going to talk about. And Big Hog asked me what I keep the thermostat on in my house. And I thought that as a married man with a child, I knew we were going to have different answers, but I didn't see this coming. Big Hog, tell Sleep Hog Nation what your thermostat's on right now. 78. God. And <laughs> listen. He said it's hot in here. Oh my God. <laughs> It is hot, <laughs> and um, it's been excessive heat warnings throughout the whole. This is the, the whole literally weekend. like maybe the hottest days in the history of humanity. If you listen to certain people tell it, Big Hawk says thermostat down seventy eight. Well, sleep. I keep it during the day when I know it's going to be extremely hot like this. Obviously, my whole side of my place is pretty much window, so it's hard to heat and cool. And so when it's hot like this, I just don't want my HVAC to be running full time. And somewhere along the lines, I had saw or seen that it's best to keep your AC at like a 76 uh, just to conserve energy. And also you run the risk if everybody had their thermostat in the low 70s of, you know, people run the risk of not having AC or something like that. And so during the day, I keep it at 78, but I will tell you what, sleep, it gets so hot at night, I drop that thing down to 68 or 60. I can't take it at night. I get too hot at night, and I sleep better when it's a little chilly. So uh, it's a struggle, and uh, so, I didn't. So let me ask yeah. you this question, all right? Let's say everybody does keep their, their thermostat at 68 except you. Do you think that you're like the the domino that if you turn yours to 68, then the AC might break for everybody? Because if not, if not, here's my question. It's like, why would you just be miserable all day? And then the, then the AC breaks so you can't get it if you want it. You know, I just ride the wave. It's like, hey, it's going go out when it goes out, you know? Yeah, well, I'm starting to rethink some things here, sleep, especially after you told me you keep it at, I get think, the low 70s. So. Yeah, dude, it's uh, 72 at our house. tops. We've got like we've got one of those nest thermostats that like apparently is supposed to learn. And I think ours might be have a learning disability because it's like always <laughs> on seventy four in here. And I come in and you know I'm like yelling at my wife about touching the thermostat, and she's like, "Dude, I haven't ever touched the thermostat." And I'm like, "Well, um, it is always hot in here." I'm like literally, my AC went out, brand new unit by the way, went out three weeks ago ish, 
and it was 78 in here. And I was called the HVAC people. I was like, you got to have somebody here in an hour or I'm going to lose my mind. Um, yeah, 78 ain't cutting it. That is just, that's some wild territory right there. So, um, yeah, dude, I'm pretty sure, especially like with the new age, because I had, we had a therm or a HVAC on the side of this house. Okay. My wife, I live in like thousand square foot house in Raleigh built in the fifties, dude. The H, the HVAC would look like the Black Pearl, dude. I mean, this thing was banged up. It looked like a World War II tank. And when it would, and the, like a tree had fallen or like tree limbs had fallen through the top, you know, so it has that thing on there so nothing gets down in the fan. Dude, there's all kinds like acorns and stuff in the fan. And that sucker would crank up and it was like, <laughs> like, I mean, it would like acorns flipping around inside a steel drum, right? But you knew when it was kicking on. You know, it just becomes white noise. And I'm telling you, dude, that thing blew cold. And uh, when we renovated our house, we tried to put a new thermostat on it and it couldn't take it. The guy that came out to fix it said he would, literally told me, I quote you, he said, I'm honored to work on this machine. He said, this is 22 years old. This HVAC is 22 years old. And I was kind of like, can you fix it? <laughs> He's like, nah, brother, I don't think it's legal to fix this thing. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, that's just... Dude, you need to get online and do a little research because I'm I'm worried about you, buddy. It's hot out there. Um, yeah, it is. It's real hot. You know who else is hot? Scotty Scheffler, dude. The guy's won six times this year, and I started thinking to myself, you've had you got obviously everybody's you know you got to try to live up to Tiger, right? That's what every guy our age is like. Tiger. I ain't saying Scotty's Tiger. Come on. What I'm asking is <clears throat> is like we've had some other guys that we thought were going to be great. I mean, for me, I really feel like in the recent era, it was like you thought Jordan Spieth was like going to be the next prodigy. And dude, I ain't heard that dude's name in a month of Sundays. Then it was like Justin Thomas and Ricky Fowler. They were all kind of the same time. Mm -hmm. Then you had like Kepka, Rory a little bit before them, but Rory had kind of come and gone, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, the staying power of Tiger Woods over like a 10 year period was crazy. So my question is, is like, is Scotty Scheffler really that good? Because it certainly seems like it. I mean, he doesn't. And I think I actually have another point I'll make in a second. I'm going to ask you that. So six wins before July hasn't been done since like Jack Nicholas in like the 70s. Now, Tiger won six times in a season, like two or three times. He won seven times in a season, eight times in a season, a couple times, nine times in a season. Like no one else has ever won as many times in a season as Tiger has when you win 80 two times i mean that's gonna happen but dude six wins in this early and he's just smoking dudes so i'm curious to know what you think like do you think scotty's gonna be the guy like is he gonna stick around at the top uh you know sleep in my golf expertise which is high yes extremely high guys um golf savant <sighs> I think the field is a little diluted, and I don't think that it's um, right to really compare now because of the Live Golf Tour yep. and the PGA. So I think Scotty's definitely the best PGA golfer, and I don't think he's playing against a top-notch talent because I think DeChambeau, to me right now, is at the peak at the mountaintop, and he plays for Live, and he's much more markable uh, with his personality – and the way he carries himself right mm -hmm. now. DeChambeau is one of the rare, the rare guys in sport where he has gone pretty much almost kind of like J.J. Redick from people hating him at Duke because, mm -hmm. you know, Duke sucks. And he, he embodied the whole Duke mantra, whatever. We'll just, just to make a short story and compare it. DeChambeau has really – He's a much more likable guy now. It seems mm -hmm. like he's really connecting with the fans. Scotty is kind of a boring person. And ever since he got a uh, got hit with some charges and went to jail for a night, I think that's a, probably the best thing that's happened to him because I that think was, that – I was going to go with it. People now know who Scotty Scheffler is. Like, yeah. it's no longer the, the librarian just going up there winning championships. <laughs> now we got some guy who's been through the – you know, been through the dirt and, you know, has, has oh, yeah. <laughs> he's been he's through the, the rigors of life and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's taking the difficult path to winning these hey, things. So it. now we got to like him. Yeah. 
No, I, I, I agree with you. And it was funny because I was thinking that to myself. And I don't me too. I mean, like, look, even Dustin Johnson was another dude that you thought was good. But he's on the live tour. John Rahm. Now they, I'm going to say I thought these guys were good. They're great. I think they I think Dustin Johnson won a, won a major at least. And, and, and so is Rahm. And like, but, yeah, you sort of split the pot here. And now, um, you know, and then there's all this stuff that I don't understand about how Liv and PJ Tour are supposed to come back together or something like that. I mean, it's just such a mess. But um, hopefully they get it together because the U.S. Open was fun to watch. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. Bryson DeChambeau was was great. And I agree with you. He's He is the guy that – I've said this on the pod many times, and I liked Payne Stewart, so this is not, not a knock on Payne Stewart. But as soon as Bryson ditched that hat, it's like he became likable again. And, uh, yeah, he's like everybody's man at this point. Like, everybody loves the guy. And Scotty's cool, too. I think Scotty's just a super nice guy. So, he's not, to your point, he's not as marketable. But uh, my thing with – um, but he's just good, dude. Like, I mean, they got to the mm-hmm. playoff today, and it was like, yeah, buddy, the playoff. Dude almost drain, almost drained one, the guy in second uh, from the fairway. And that's kind of like what he needed to win. And – um yeah, and then Scotty beat him in a playoff. But before that happened, on the 18th green, this will be newsworthy. Um, these protesters run off. Like these guys come up on the green. Last last group is Scotty, some John Kim, maybe, and, and and another guy. And like they're all on the green and they're about to not about to putt as in they're addressing the ball, but they're like walking up, you know, sort of like, you know, getting their putters out and talking to their caddy. And these dudes start running on the green with like these canisters of like red white and blue chalk or something like that mm-hmm. and like <laughs> i just couldn't help i'm sitting there watching it because i literally was like bummed out i was like dude what am i gonna watch there's no sports on um and they run out there and most of the time you know the broadcast they'll they'll turn it away or oh we got a guy blah blah blah. we're gonna go to a commercial league like, nah man they were there and jim nance was like and we got another one coming out of the crowd and like shaking up a such and such a powdery and then the cameras on the dude he's on getting pinned down on the green i was like all right this is cool but it kind of dawned on me i was like this is the whole purpose of a protest like i don't know what the hell these guys are protesting like they're all going to jail mm-hmm. for what like were they just drunk i mean if that's that's it that's it but like you know now there's all these oil protests where you guys are going and like spraying the mona lisa with oil or something and it's like all right, like, I think you're an idiot, but I still know at least what you're protesting. These guys, they're just like, I mean, maybe maybe they really wanted to be like more like Scotty. Maybe they'd never done hard time and just, you know, <laughs> thought he'd be cool if they were like, hey, dude, listen, man, I've done a bid myself. I don't know. Well, Sleep, listen, <clears throat> I have no idea what they're protesting, but if I was a security guard or a police officer oh, and I saw I somebody do. run I out. I live for that, dude. Oh, man. You don't know the amount of excitement. I would absolutely <laughs> level, level that person. Uh, and I always a get Goldberg. a joy out of it. I would hit him with a Goldberg. Oh, <laughs> I've got a buddy of mine, Big Moose, one of my uh, best friends. Moose. He's always going from job to job. And Shout he's out, Moose. Security stuff. And, uh. I always wish he was one of those security guards that when one of these protesters ran out there because he would absolutely floor oh, dude. Uh, one of these he's climate a big, people. He's a big, good he's guy. A unit. Oh, yeah. He's, he, guys, he's like 6'8", 315. He's like Joey Bosa's a, size. Yeah, I mean, this dude's Just a big dude. Absolutely and, uh, somebody. Oh, dude, he would light somebody <laughs> up. But I always, I always like to see how hard these really? guys get hit. You can always tell the one security guard that's really on – their game because they're right there in the mix oh, yeah. and they're going after them. You can Dude, also get exposed yeah. as well oh, if you're yeah. out of shape. Yeah, you can get that hamstring pull. You get you let that dude oh, yeah. run around in center field is like a like a like he looked like a rodeo clown, you know, mm-hmm. chasing that dude around. Uh, but yeah, there's always that one dude like ex paramilitary guys is like waiting for it <laughs> and just hits you like like a blindside hit in the NFL. Uh, I'm with you, dude. I would love. I'd be, I'd get a shoestring tackle or something though. Somebody probably run me over. Um, <laughs> I was I was watching some on you know Instagram. You just go down these rabbit holes, and I was watching something. This girl got on some stage at a concert of some rap singer that I never heard. And the security guards were just like, forget it, man. I'm just letting her go. She was just up there, <laughs> just rapping. Um, man, I forgot what we were, what were we just talking about about uh, it, oh, dude, I got a note. I got another note. 
my dad was on the Antiques Roadshow. Um, we'll talk about that before the end of the podcast. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Sleep Dogs will be doing the podcast this. for a while because, uh, spoiler alert, it just, stuff wasn't worth anything. So UNC lost out in the College World Series. It's a super bummer. Um, and uh, the – I mean – it's just a long season, man. Like they had a great run and baseball is just such a weird thing. Like, I mean, I feel like in, in basketball, you know, the good team can win and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, or the best team can win. And in baseball, I'm not saying the teams because Tennessee, I think is, is playing Texas A&M and they're two of the top teams in the country. But um, I don't know. I can't act like I watched a ton of it outside of, uh, outside of some of the playoff games, but you know, Great season what for we the gave Tar Heels, him, worth mentioning. We gave them a little coverage, and yeah. uh, sure enough, as soon as we cover them, yeah, the, the curse, curse lives is on. real, guys. I mean, godly. Wow. Well, Sorry, guys. Yeah, I mean, I would, maybe we shouldn't talk about this hockey game. I forgot about the hockey. I've skipped right over it. Um, <laughs> let's talk about that. So, because I don't care who wins that. So if we curse them, mm-hmm. we curse them. So Florida Panthers go up. 3 0. And hockey's a little different. Like, that, this, this is going to happen in hockey. It's just still not likely. Uh, we'll go, uh, Big Hawks got a hell of a fact on that. Um, but all of a sudden, this dude, Connor McDavid, whom I've heard of, right? I've never seen him. And I always kind of thought about, you know, with hockey and the Canes being local. Like, I mean, we love the Canes games. They're fun, especially the playoff games. <clears throat> but it's also a cool opportunity to see like some of these great players when they come through like i've seen ovechkin i've seen back in the day i saw brett hole and a few other guys like i never saw wayne gretzky but uh i've seen lemieux and those before they retired and i've always kind of thought to myself like <clears throat> like now i want to see this kid bedard but i had never seen mcgregor or uh mcdavid i keep calling him connor mcgregor it's connor mcdavid and uh dude he just watching some of his highlights, I don't know, <laughs> buddy. I couldn't. Uh, my hurricane. I mean, my uh, hockey knowledge stops at the Mighty Ducks movie from like the nineties. <laughs> but this dude is insane, um, and he's leading the charge. Three zero series is now three three. Game seven is tomorrow night, and Sleep Dog will be watching. Yeah, G- game seven for any professional uh, sports playoffs is exciting and uh for anyone who hasn't been to many uh nhl playoff hockey games the atmosphere is electric i've actually been to a stanley cup game before unbelievable environment uh but if you're not following hockey which a lot of people don't and i really don't either but i always kind of like casually tune in to the playoffs just because the playoffs can be really exciting uh the atmospheres are electric but the the Connor McDavid kid, I call him kid. I think he's kind of a vet now. He arguably is the best player to ever play the game, and uh, a lot of people are hyping him up, and he he matches the hype. Um, plays for Edmonton Oilers, I think. Yep. Um, but um, they were down O three. Yep, they were down O three. And they have forced a game seven, so basically won three games in a row. And arguably, this is one of the biggest uh, professional sports collapses in history done by the Florida Panthers. And uh, the thing that I enjoy about this most is I have a buddy of mine, Howard, went to UNC, went to school with him, Sleep Dog. Um, he's a big, Howie. he's a big Florida, yeah, he's a big Florida fan, and. Uh, I'm going to be tuning in to see what he puts up on the story, see uh, what he has to say about this one, because I, I hate to say it, I'm pulling for the Oilers. And uh, I want I love a classic shit job, and we'll just call it what it is. <laughs> trying to – sorry, Dad. Sue me. Uh, trying to clean up the language. Um, it's a meltdown. It's a, it's, a, it's a meltdown of all meltdowns. The last time we've had a meltdown of this magnitude in the NHL is 1942. The Ma- Toronto Maple Leafs <laughs> forced a game seven after being down 0-3, and they actually won the series. America so uh, lost a hockey game in World War II. Like, yeah, and so shocker. and the Maple Leafs hadn't been back since. I don't know if that's true or not, but I <laughs> hey, lived in I'm Toronto, sure and I know true. how much 
I know how much they care about hockey, and boy, they suck about every year. Never meet the expectations the city puts on them. And there's so much pressure playing in Toronto that no one can ever match or meet the height that it takes to to please that city. They could win 25 Stanley Cups in a row, and it still wouldn't meet the expectations that the the city of Toronto puts on that team. But no. Uh, no, I'm I can't wait for Game Seven tomorrow. I'll actually be pretty pumped about it. It's gonna be good. Old Noah was just about finished building the ark the last time this happened. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> tune in. It's at eight o'clock. I actually just remembered I'm going to a concert tomorrow with Wyatt. By the way, um, so I might miss. Who it, you guys going to? We're going to Tinder see Future Control? Islands, man. Oh, okay. You ever heard of Future yeah. Islands? Big fan. No, I have not. Well, Future Islands, man. It's a great band. Um, actually we're, uh, high school friends with two guys on the band and they, uh, band just blew up. I mean, it's crazy. They're famous as hell. Uh, been on Letterman, Kimmel and all that stuff. It's in Raleigh. Um, I'll be asleep by halfway through it though. Cause it starts at eight o'clock. Um, Celtics won the championship. Speaking of things, I was getting ready to say it hadn't happened in a long time. I just dropped my pen. Um, Celtics won since we last talked. We talked about how boring that was. We, I mean, look, I told you guys last time that I ate breakfast next to Rory McIlroy. Kapow, that guy's done. I told you that we started to like Kyrie Irving. Dude has probably the worst stretch of games of his entire career. Mm-hmm. Give, the, give the coverage to the heels. No chance. You know, I told you Drake May was going to win the Heisman Trophy. Like, screwed that one. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, Drake. Sorry, Drake, man. <laughs> I still think you should have won it get personally. You know, they give us, I mean, we'll be in the media at some point someday and I'll vote for you. Mm-hmm. Post, po- uh, what is it called? Post mortem. Sort of because you're alive, you know, but college football is over. Uh, guys, we're, we're, we're scratching and clawing here. So, I mean, listen, here's the thing is how corny is Jason Tatum now? Now, all of a sudden, no one likes Jason Tatum. Dude is like yeah. talking about call me champ now. Uh, said something about being the best player in the world. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jalen Brown won the MVP, uh, which is also another weird thing because I'm pretty sure Jason Tatum led the team in points, rebounds, and assists. Um, but it just seemed like such a weak – I don't know, man. Boston was definitely good. Like, don't get me wrong. But I think Jalen Brown – is a pretty underrated player, even though he's not underpaid. Highest paid player in the NBA, which is also mind boggling. But like LeBron wasn't there. The Warriors weren't there. Durant wasn't there. Like all these blue chip guys that have traditionally, like, is this a passing of the torch or is this like, you know, um, cause I mean, hell they even, even like Dallas got through OKC and they got through the wolves uh, or, or, or out of that conference, and I mean the Bucks had Giannis go down. Boston's a good team, but like I think Drew Holiday and all this sort of stuff. Like, like I'm not taking away anything. They they won who was in front of them. What I'm taking away from it is it's like how does the thing that blew my mind is Jason Tatum, very young guy. Not I think he's 26 years old. Like yep. very good player. Not taking anything away from him. He's a great player. Not even an unlikable Duke guy. Until he wins his first championship and somehow becomes less likable at, by at large. Like I, I got when everybody hated that LeBron won or whatever because they hate. But I mean, like, I mean, he's he's a star, and people are just gonna, you know, um, not like him because he's a star for somebody else's team. But Tatum's not like that. So it's just so weird to me. Like I can't think in in recent memory of like a guy that finally does what he's supposed to do on the track that you're supposed to do it ahead of, you know, just obviously very good, like MVP sort of peripheral player. <laughs> Everybody's just like, yeah, this dude's yep. lame. Yeah. And sleep. We talked about this before the playoffs. We talked about Jason Tatum, his stardom and like mm-hmm. where he's considered in you know, in the same category as some of these stars in the NBA. People have him right there with Steph. People have them right there with LeBron. But he's not one of those guys where, you know, people gravitate, oh, hey, we got to go see him. Mm-hmm. We've got to go see him. When 
LeBron comes to your city, you've got to go check him out. Steph, same thing. But he's still that level of player. Mm -hmm. And I I will admit that he is a little awkward in some of his celebrations. And uh, it's been a little bit, at (laughs) times, a little cringe. Yeah, it's it's been a little cringe, cringy. But, (laughs) uh, hey, I I just want to say – I've got to give him a lot of respect because he's an NBA champion and mm-hmm. uh, people can hate what they want, but also not a lot of people are giving the Celtics the credit they deserve. You know how many games they lost this in these playoffs? Well, like four, three. Wow. If, if my math is right. So they swept <laughs> the Pacers. Uh, they went five games with Cleveland, five, five games with Miami, and then five games with Dallas. So they lost three, Only three. That's a hell of a run. That's a and sort of legendary run. Yeah. Yeah, and not a lot of people are talking about it. Now, you got to give Missoula a lot of credit as well mm-hmm. because last year people were trying to knock and hate him. Uh, he's a little inexperienced. He can't do this, blah, 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 blah. He's, he's not playoff ready. Not a lot of people are really giving him the credit he deserves. He's handled himself tremendously with the press. Uh, he's been no nonsense. He hasn't really – you know, you saw Jason Kidd try to give the little – stir the pot comments he weathered that storm and i think this team was as together and their chemistry within each other was as great as any team i've seen in the playoffs since i've been watching the nba Mm -hmm. now people will say that the east was banged up and they had an easy route boston was banged up porzingis wasn't healthy for the whole playoffs he was out he was in out in out they handled their business and they did what they needed to do and they got the job done efficiently. And, I mean, this wasn't even really a series. I mean, Dallas scrapped one out. But, mm-hmm. good God, this was just a, this was a lopsided series. And it's going to be interesting because Boston has so many weapons. And Dallas got really exposed. Luka got exposed defensively. Mm-hmm. Boston had so many weapons offensively that they couldn't hide Luka on defense. Yep. And, he got exposed. You could see that Luca was struggling with the pick and rolls, help side defense, and he was taking a beating on the other end because the Celtics had multiple defenders. They had veterans. They had guys who knew where to be in position, and they wore on um, they wore on Luca in a way that I think he was like he went back to just complaining nonstop, mm-hmm. and it looked really bad. And it showed his inexperience and his youth as well. Yeah, in the areas of game where he needs to improve. I I, I mean, the, the Celtics team, to me, looks like a team that could be built for a dynasty. Believe it or not, they just extended Drew Holiday. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they've got Jalen Brown. Jason mm-hmm. Tatum's about to sign extension. Those are your, like, and Porzingis, I mean, you have that core. And listen, Al Horford, I mean, this guy yep. is – He's ancient at this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I played against him. I thought he was a vet when I was in the league. (laughs) He's still around. Like, they'll find – there's guys that can replace these guys that are going to be out. They're going to have to figure out what's going to happen with Derek White. They have bench players, too. Uh, The one kid, Pritchard, that comes Mm -hmm. in off the bench, that dude does his job as any – you know, as well as any bench player in the NBA. Hauser can shoot And so, I mean, yeah, and – You've got to look at this team. You've got to think that the Celtics, they're not going anywhere. And uh, it's going to be interesting because the 76ers are starting to, like, mm-hmm. you're starting to hear them in a lot of rumors with Paul George and some other free agents. It's going to get a little interesting to see what teams do in the East because the Celtics, they're kind of, they're posturing themselves to be, they're going to be around for the long haul. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, everything that I've said about Tatum is like that's like it seems to be that people don't like him uh or I shouldn't say that I should say they like him less because it like, stuff does seem a little cringy corny that sort of stuff but I think you're right I mean I, at the end of the day I definitely think that they had look you 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 play the people that are in front of you the west all season was stacked I mean you got the 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 10th place 11th place team is like four or five games out of fourth or fifth place in the league. So, I mean, that's not anything anybody didn't know. But at the end of the year, if you sit back and look back at it, I mean, Boston was the best team in the, in the league from start to finish the season. And and it really the playoffs is a great call out on the three losses because when you sit back and look at the playoffs, it really reflected that. And you're right. It, you know, Porzingis, I think people forget how good that dude is. I mean, he's seven mm-hmm. feet tall. 
Like, oh, I mean, everybody makes some four. Yeah. yeah. Everybody makes a big deal out of Wimbenyama and out of, you know, Chet Holmgren and rightfully so. I mean, let me, if you mm-hmm. listen to this podcast, you know, I've fucking both feet in my mouth on that one, but you know, um, but dude, he's the original, you know, and, and, and on a team where he doesn't have to be the guy, I mean, what a weapon. And then Tatum and Brown are two of the best players in the league, undoubtedly. And you're right. I think Holiday is, to me, is one of the probably, and I think he comes up on these lists a lot, one of the most underrated players in the NBA. I think real NBA people probably would um, actually agree with Sleep Dog on that one. That's, But, yeah, I think in the end, you're right. There's they're, they're, they're seem, They seem fortified for a, a, a long term in a way that, you know, even Milwaukee is always, you know, there's whispers about, like, you remember Lillard didn't want to go to Milwaukee. I think he, he, mm-hmm. he took it. But, you know, I don't I don't necessarily know that there's, you know, not something going on there. The 76ers like Embiid, I like Embiid a lot. It's just like I, I worry that Embiid's going to be that guy that can never actually stay healthy long enough to it, which really sucks because he's he's among the best players like I've seen best best big man I've seen since Shaq. I mean, he's really mm-hmm. a dominant player and Tyrese Maxey's incredible and they got some other role players, but I just don't see them more the bucks and then then where are you gonna go i mean like there's not a lot uh left in the east i mean i think orlando is sneakily putting together like a really good young team there's talks they're trying to get clay thompson and some of the stuff in the off season um you know they could be a real sneaky player for one of these prime prospects but like they're not going to go get a paul george or something because you know they got to give up some of those guys but they got they got a lot of assets so you know i'm with you man um <clears throat> I also am with you on on Dallas and on Luca. It'll be here's what I think will be really interesting. So Kyrie, I'll stand by it. Hated Kyrie. Kyrie is becoming a player that I like. You know, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about my newfound feeling for Kyrie because he still said and did a lot of things that I personally don't agree with. Mm-hmm. Um, but he seems so like to acknowledge it, to be humble, to still stand on the shit that he believes in. And I don't have to believe in it. You know what I mean? But I respect people that, that stand for it. I thought he handled the whole Boston situation very well. Um, He didn't play well and who knows what, what caused that or whatnot. And who knows what him playing well would have done. But I think you're right. So chips going to fall on Luca. And here's, here's what I think would really, here's what I think is going to tell you what Luke is going to become in terms of his NBA legacy. He needs to go and show up next season and be one of those guys that has cut about 10 pounds and turned it all into muscle. Like really, I mean, you say this a lot, like focus on his body and his quickness. And I mean, the guy is absolutely incredible player. Mm -hmm. Right. But dude, I'm pretty sure I'm not, I think I would be about as effective on defense as he is. And I'm not joking, (laughs) buddy. That dude is like a mailbox on defense against Mm -hmm. some of these guys. And dude, you can't play 40 minutes in a game in an NBA playoff game, NBA conference finals, NBA finals against great teams and expect that to be sustainable, man. Like, you're going to yeah. get eaten a lot because you're putting up forth. I would imagine you're putting forth so much effort on offense to be that great that, you know, lacking fundamentals and being gassed and then, you know, just not, not mentally strong enough to lay off the reps and focus on, you know, the areas where you need to improve. I'm with you on that. And it's disappointing. Our, one of my close friends is a huge Luca fan. I like Luca. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just kind of wish that, I don't know, man. I guess when I get old, like even these guys in the NBA, it's sort of like like Kaminga. I mean, I'm a huge Kaminga fan, obviously. But like sometimes I'll watch him like, dude, don't, don't, man. Don't, don't complain to the refs Mm -hmm. like that. Just, just fucking get back down. Sorry. And and sleep. The the other thing is like these refs are human too. And, uh, you know, I was watching. Uh, and we treat them. I that talked way. about. We treat them with utmost yeah. respect here on Super Bowl. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and listen, uh, you know, playing in the league, and you watch some of these refs sometimes in the interaction. I can tell when a player's complaining too much, and it's really bothering mm-hmm. the ref. Now, Luca's in that category where he, 
he has a green light to go after the refs. Mm-hmm. He is a superstar. Yeah. Superstar gets in the NBA mm-hmm. right now. And uh, I will just say somebody of his status is going to get the benefit of the whistle. Mm-hmm. And for Luca to think that he's getting a bad whistle at any <laughs> point in the playoffs is ludicrous. Yeah. Okay. And I could see that he was complaining so much. And when he fouled out that one game, mm-hmm. he looked at the bench. He said, you better review that. And I saw Mark Davis. I saw I saw him light up when they said we're going to review him. Okay, I'll go look at it. I'll be darned. I've never seen a ref get excited to get on the mic and be like, the call stands after reviewing the play. There was a foul. Luca has been disqualified. Yeah. Like he uh, yeah. was smiling and excited yeah. to announce that in Dallas. Yeah. And I just laughed. I was like, that's so funny. That's a good call. Uh, but uh, you know, and watching these, watching the finals. It's tough because Luca took a big hit, mm-hmm. and everyone started getting a little criticism, which he doesn't really see receive a ton of criticism. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was at one point, I was like, listen, if I were going to start a team, I would take Jason Tatum over Luca." And the reason I said that is because Jason Tatum can affect the game in more ways than Luca. I feel like Luca is a ball-dominant guard as ball-dominant gets. He has to have – he's a volume shooter. He's a volume guy. He's got to have the ball. And I feel like even if you were to surround him with more superstars, I'm not sure that the superstar would really do the benefit that you would expect adding them to the team unless you added like just a like a Rudy Gobert or somebody mm-hmm. who is just a defensive monster. And the reason I think Tatum was really good for Boston and the team that they have is because he doesn't have to be Superman all the time, even though he puts up these crazy stats. Athletically, he can affect the game defensively. He cuts without the ball. His ball, off-ball movement is really well. Where Luke is still like, I still don't think that's there. Even though he is a very spectacular passer and gets his teammates involved, he takes the ball and he's very ball dominant. So mm-hmm. that's that was my my only kind of eye-opening thing in the in the NBA finals that I watched. And I could change my mind on that because Luca is so good. Uh, and uh, I've actually picked him to be the MVP multiple times mm-hmm. uh, before the season started um, uh, for a couple seasons now. But that was my only eye-opening thing in the finals when I watched it sleep. Boy, they're pretty even on paper, too. I'm sitting here looking at um, over their career. Like, I feel like Luca is a pretty – um durable player right i'm curious who's play because i feel like tatum never misses games maybe i'm yeah, wrong maybe I, maybe i've missed that but the the, the whole thing with luca not being in shape or kind of like people questioning his you know condition it's kind of I, I it's kind of like head scratching to me uh-huh why yeah, he doesn't like I, come into the season a little bit in better shape sometimes i'm, I'm a little I'm, I'm confused by that well, and I wonder too whether or not he's not in bad shape, and he's just—I mm-hmm. don't know—like doesn't look like a prototype muscular dude. Because, dude, he puts these numbers up. But the only yeah. thing—and again, like I mean, Wayne Ellington definitely put me in my place in terms of knowing what the hell's going on in the NBA. I have to say, I peaked in high school would be putting nicely for basketball because I was the worst player on the worst team, state of North Carolina. That's my catchphrase <laughs> as a basketball player, but. um you know, you just kind of look at him and, you know, defense is what takes sort of endurance, right? I mean, like, that's where oh, yeah. I just always feel like the offensive side of the ball is like so much more of an adrenaline type thing. Like, you can kind of get by on off. You see dudes all the time making shots late in games and that sort of thing. And I feel like you can get by on the adrenaline that gets created by offense, whereas defense requires focus, you know, uh, condition and that sort of stuff. And so, I don't know, man, maybe, maybe Luca, um, maybe he's not in bad shape. I mean, he's the best player in the world, one of the best players in the yeah. world. So, but it was, I mean, I think it's, it's, I don't know. It just really sets a great storyline for the NBA for next year, because there's going to be a lot, a lot of players. I think that are in new places. Draft is Thursday, I believe. Got two round, two separate day NBA draft. 
not going to get super into that because I know you guys, if you guys are still awake now, then uh, you're real fans. But um, that's going to be interesting because they invite these guys to the green room. The second day, the draft isn't even in the same place. So if some guy comes to the green room and doesn't get drafted in the first round, what the hell is he going to do? You know? Uh, <laughs> help oh, the guys yeah. clean up after the thing? But uh, It's a I, very weak draft. Yeah, I couldn't well. tell you. I couldn't tell you. Um, any of these pros, any of these like, I mean, I know a couple of these guys, but these foreign prospects and stuff are really, really changing things. Uh, I want to say one thing: when Monty Williams, coach of the Suns, gets fired, he is owed like thirty million dollars. That, that might be a little high. Then he's hot co- hired as coach of Detroit Pistons. I texted <laughs> Big Hog. He's like, "Well, they were fourteen and sixty nine last year." I was like, "Well, that'll do it." Uh, maybe <laughs> you know, he loses a lot of games. Fourteen to sixty eight. Or however many to get to eighty two, I was like, "That's a great, very, very valid point." Um, but they owe him sixty five million dollars. So this dude has yeah. been in two years. He's been NBA coach and has, will earn eighty million dollars doing nothing. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that was all. That was one piece of it. The other one, real quickly, JJ Redick getting the uh, uh, they getting the Lakers job. What do you think about that? Well, I. <laughs> I just think the Lakers have so much issues right now. I don't think really there's a head coach out there that's going to fix all their problems. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, whether you think J.J. Reddick is going to be a great coach or not, you know, I I don't think he has the experience or the evidence to really point towards him being, Mm -hmm. you know, a great coach. But I will say he's – seems like he has a pretty good basketball mind. He does Mm -hmm. really well with his, you know, analyst and – seems very, you know, focused on tactics and, you know, how to scheme against different, you know, situations. But, you know, it's a little different when you're in the media and you can be a Monday coach. Uh, So we'll see how he is. Uh, I think this will be a good challenge for him. Uh, You know, I'm not going to hate on JJ um, just yet, but, you know, he's, uh, you know, to me, this is a pinnacle of head coaching jobs out there. I don't think there's a better head coaching job than coaching the L.A. Lakers mm-hmm. uh, in the NBA. I think, you know, their program, their tradition and being in L.A. and, you know, the ability to go out and pretty much lure any free agent they want to is, you know, speaks for itself. So um, we'll see. I, I'm I'm very intrigued. I'll be in tuned. I'll be watching. Yeah. I mean, I, I like J.J. I think it's uh, I think it's a good hire. Um, hard not to look up the hi- <clears throat> up the highway there and sort of draw comparisons to the whole Steve Kerr path. You know what I mean? Similar player mm-hmm. didn't nearly. Obviously, JJ didn't win. I don't think JJ ever won a championship. Maybe, uh, maybe he did, but he didn't win like five or six or whatever Steve Kerr did. Um, but seemed to be highly intelligent, high IQ. Have played with high profile players. Um, the, the weirdest part of all is like, what is he going to do with the podcast? You know, I mean, him and LeBron James have a podcast. That is going to be some, I mean, obviously I got to put that on ice, right? I mean, that's going to be interesting. So oh, man, I hope LeBron dude, if LeBron wants to join as a third host, I mean, I think we'd take him. Um, yeah. JJ, welcome. no LeBron. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. executive decision from sleep dog, uh, getting out of here on this one. My dad, all right. Was on. Antiques Roadshow, dude. I almost sent you the video. So I don't know how many people watch this show, but like it's old, dude. It's been it's hard to believe how long this show's been coming on. And my dad just loves this stuff, right? So they go to Baltimore, go to Jimmy's. My dad must have told me every day for two solid weeks that he's going to Jimmy's famous seafood. And I'm like, all right, dad, cool, man. That's it's gonna be great. You're gonna love it. Um, so he went. It was, it was great. He loved it. Um and then they go stand out in the heat, dude, like 90-some degrees outside. And they brought these – they they took the train. And they brought these jugs they bought when they lived in Japan, like these ceramic things. And I'm sitting here watching them. I'm like – they're literally – they're on the, the YouTube channel, not on the, the PBS one. Mm-hmm. And they pull this first jug out, and I'm like – well, dude, I can look at that thing and tell you it ain't worth any money, man. Why don't you go out and drag out? My parents, like, they brought three jugs that are, like, big things, you know, like, wow, like, big sizes. And I'm like, what in the hell, job bring bringing all these things? And the total, the guy's like, yeah, this is worth 30 to $50 at auction, and I guarantee you 
Dad, I know you listen to this, man. I'm sorry, but I guarantee that dude was lying to you. There's no way that things worth <laughs> 30 bucks. And that and the funniest part was that is like it had one with like horses on it. And this dude off the top of his head is just like, oh, these are the seven horses of Wang Shuang or whatever, because and he's like, What's those horses' names? And the lady agreed with him. I'm like, this guy's just making this shit up. <laughs> he has no idea what this means, man. Like, do you cannot tell me that two people buy a random jug at a flea market in Japan and bring it towed it all the way across the world up ninety five on the train to Jimmy Seafood. Dad probably had it sitting in the booth with him at Jimmy's Seafood and take it outdoors, stand outside in the heat for 100 degrees for three hours and hand it to you. <clears throat> and you know what all three of those jugs are. Get out of here. Okay? I, I don't buy it. One second. Dad, you can put whatever you want in that jug, man. The jug's priceless, man. They're 30 to 50 dollars. <laughs> Actually, probably worth, he's probably right on the price. He probably doesn't know what the hell he's talking about on the story. I love knowing what they paid. Anyway, you ever seen the Antiques Roadshow? No. Is, is it on YouTube? I'm going to have to go look <laughs> yeah, at dude, it. I'll, for I'll sure. send you the link, right. man. Oh, gosh. Maybe we'll probably pin it to the story. Poor parents, man. I thought my mom was going <laughs> to give out and die. She had a face all red. She was standing out there. I think she got – so this is the last thing I'll say about it. You get you get a lottery ticket. You go you get to bring two items. So my dad's like, hey, honey, you're going too. So I can bring four. And they were all <laughs> <laughs> You got anything else, Big Hawk? Stay safe. Stay safe out there. It's hot. Thermostats down.